activities. And we are proud to announce that we have more than 1,000 people uh, following us on Instagram. And we are very uh, happy for that. On the top of almost uh, uh, 4,000 people who register for our YouTube channel. So register, please, to our YouTube channel as well. So you can uh, see our uh, previous meetings and uh, the meetings going on. All of our meetings, they are broadcasted live on YouTube for your convenience uh, as well. So just a little bit of Zoom education uh, for you not to miss any part of the screen of the speaker. So you go to view options on the top of your screen now, and then you, you click on side, to side by side mode. So you are going to able to view the entire screen of the speaker and you're not going to miss uh, any piece of it. Uh, we have two ways of communication with you during this meeting. Uh, if you want to just say something, say hello, say where are you from, uh, please uh, text that on the chat box. Don't forget to click in all attendees and panelists because by default, what we have is only to the panelists to read what you are texting. So if you want everybody to read it, please uh, uh, check all attendees and panelists before you send your chat uh, message. And please make questions. Please type your questions on the Q&A box. Uh, on the end of the sessions, we are going to choose some of them to answer live. And if you feel like making our question live, if you want to speak with Dr. Anderson, please click on raise your hand. And in the end of the session, we are going to allow you to open your camera and your audio, and you're going to be able to uh, make your question live to Dr. Anderson. Uh, I'm going to announce to you our next uh, uh, classrooms of these morphology sessions uh, with Dr. Anderson. We are very, very happy, Dr. Anderson. Thank you very much for continuing to do this with us. So next Friday, we are going to have double outlet right ventricle. The next one on the August the 7th, we are going to talk about transposition. Then we are going to have one week off. So Friday on the 14th of August, we, we are not going to have a session. But we are, we are going to go come back on the 21st of August. We are going to talk about discordant AV connections. And then the next Friday on 28th of August, we are going to talk about common arterial trunk. And next Monday, uh, this Monday on the 27th of uh, July, Dr. Mary Cohen is going to talk about uh, the echo of double outlet right ventricle. Uh, this has been very interesting sessions. We hope all of you can join. Just notice that uh, this is going to be not at our regular time of 9, 9 a.m. East, 3 p.m. European time. It's going to be in the afternoon or in the evening for some of you. It's going to be 1 p.m. East time, 7 p.m. Uh, European time. We are going to, to, to have a very nice session. And save the date, on August the 3rd, we are going to have the second uh, uh, classroom with Dr. Silverman. He did the first one a couple of months ago about truncus, and now we are going to talk about transposition. And he makes a very nice cor correlation between images and morphology. This has been a, a, a very nice series as well. Uh, we hope all of, you, all of you can join. It's 10 a.m. East, 5, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, European time. Our next big masterclass is going to be about sudden death and, and hatred arrhythmias. Uh, it's going to be very nice. We are preparing uh, such great speakers. We are going to send it to you uh, by email, but save the date. Uh, so next Thursday, we are going to be still on vacation, but the next one, August the 6th, we are going to have this big masterclass. We hope all of you uh, can join. And we have uh, something very special to announce to all of you. Dr. Anderson and Dr. Vernovsky kindly uh, are given uh, to all of you a discount on uh, the Pediatric Cardiology Anderson's uh, textbook. So you can enter the Elsevier uh, website and then you just uh, type on the this distant, uh, discount code Anderson35 and you are going to be able to get this discount. So that's pretty much what I had uh, to share with you in this beginning. And now we are going to begin the session with Dr. Anderson. Thanks again, all of you for joining us. So why did we need to move to segmental analysis, which as you all know, was introduced by Richard and Stella Van Prague. 
was because prior to the 1960s, oftentimes there was a bucket approach for some congenitally malformed hearts that were called miscellaneous. And Richard made the point, if we adopted a logical approach, we had a system that could cater for any heart that was congenitally malformed, even if it had never been seen before. So here is a picture of Richard and Stella. Sadly, Stella is no longer with us, but Richard is still active in the field. I'm told that he still visits the archive that he set up in Boston, and he contributes to its ongoing analysis. So why did problems arise when we started in the field in Europe and produced the modification of the segmental approach that we call sequential segmental analysis? Well, the segmental approach itself was developed by Richard and his colleagues through the 1960s. And when we came into the field in the early 1970s, the segmental approach was well established, but subsequent to our own efforts, these disagreements did develop. And the disagreements now devolve on one particular topic. Do the segments, which Richard described with his colleagues in the 1960s, connect one to the other? And developing from that notion, Another potentially controversial, controversial topic is the way we describe normal and abnormal ventricles. So let's step back and let's look at the starting point, which was the Van Proggen approach, which without question revolutionized the way that we analyze the congenitally malformed heart. So in those initial works that Dr. Van Praag and his colleagues published in the 1960s, they postulated the existence of these three segments within the congenitally malformed heart. Now, we fully accepted the notion that the heart itself could be analyzed in tripartite fashion, but our major concern at the time, which was the middle part of the 1970s, was the ability to assess the way in which the segments were joined together. So here is the Van Pragen approach. He made the point that in any congenitally malformed heart, you can take the building blocks, as it were, apart, the atrial chambers, the ventricular mass, the arterial trunks. And the beauty of segmental analysis is that we know that within each of these segments, there is very limited variation in the way that the components can be put together. And so that really is the essence of segmental analysis. So when we came into the field, as I say, this was the beginning and the middle part of the 1970s, I was working with my clinical colleagues. I'd started work at the Brompton Hospital at the time where I was working with Elliot Scheinborn. We also established a relationship with Fergus McCartney. At the time, Fergus was working in Leeds, but shortly thereafter, he came down to London. And also, we were working closely with Michael Tynan. Michael Tynan at that time was in Newcastle, but he too came down to London, and the four of us together started looking at how we could analyze the congenitally malformed heart in segmental fashion. A starting point was to analyze the variation in the segments exactly as had been described by Dr. Van Praag. But our concern then was to produce specificity in establishing the way that the segments were connected together across the atrioventricular and the ventricular arterial junctions. In many ways, we were fortunate because in the middle of the 1970s and the latter part of the 1970s, our investigation of these hearts coincided with the introduction of cross-sectional echocardiography. 
And cross-sectional echocardiography, as you all know, now gives us the ability to look in great detail at the junctions between the segments, whereas previously the variation had been depending very much on analysis of angiocardiograms, and it was not always possible to see the way that the segments join together over their junctions. So why did problems arise? And I now believe that all the problems stemmed from the fact that we misunderstood at that initial time the use of concordance and discordance. Because we were using, as I will explain, concordance and discordance to describe concordant and discordant connections across those junctions. And even now, there are many who do not appreciate the subtle difference between concordance and concordant connections. So let me try to explain what I am now talking about. So here are two arrangements across the atrioventricular junction. To your left hand, you see the setting in which the atrial chambers are usually arranged, and they are joined across the atrioventricular junction to a ventricular mass that shows right-handed ventricular topology. And almost without exception in this setting, morphologically, right atrium has its cavity connecting to the cavity, morphologically right ventricle. The morphologically left atrium is in communication with the cavity of the morphologically left ventricle. Now to your right hand, you see the situation in which everything is mirror imaged. So when we have mirror imaged atrial chambers, along with left-handed ventricular topology, still we have the situation in which the cavity of the right atrium pumps its blood across the atrioventricular junction into the cavity of the left-sided morphologically right ventricle, whilst on the right side, cavity morphologically left atrium, which is right-sided, pumps its blood into the cavity of the morphologically left ventricle. And at the time when we introduced sequential segmental analysis, we called this atrioventricular concordance, because we thought that the concordance represented the flow of blood through the heart. Now, what we had not appreciated is that when Dr. Van Prague was describing the arrangement as we see in the normal heart, and as you all know, Dr. Van Prague considers the normal atrial chambers as being situs solitus, S in segmental nomenclature. He considers right-handed ventricular topology as representing a D bulboventricular loop, D in segmental nomenclature, atrioventricular concordance. What we had not appreciated at the time is that when you see this arrangement, in which again we have usually arranged atrial chambers, situs solitus, but this time both atrioventricular junctions are joining across the atrioventricular junction with a large ventricle that has left ventricular apical trabeculations. And then there is a second chamber present, and I'm showing you the arrangement here in which the second chamber, which Dr. Van Prague calls an infundibular outlet chamber, is positioned right sidedly. And Dr. Van Prague takes this as being situs solitus, and then because of the right sided position of the infundibular outlet chamber, this is representative of a D bulboventricular loop. So this is what Dr. Van Prague called atrioventricular concordance. Unfortunately, what we hadn't appreciated was that despite the fact that in the arrangement you see to your right hand, the heart is showing double inlet left ventricle, because there is situs solitus and a D bulboventricular loop, this, for Dr. Van Prague, was still atrioventricular concordance. Because in Van Prague's segmental no, no, uh, notation, if you have SD or if you have IL, 
that irrespective of how the cavities of the atrial chambers are joined across the atrioventricular junctions to their respective ventricles, there is always atrioventricular concordance. In other words, for Dr. Van Praag, atrioventricular concordance was indicative of segmental harmony. So then we can step forward, we can say that whenever you have SL or ID in Van Praagian notation, then here we have segmental disharmony, and it is the segmental disharmony that Dr. Van Praag was identified as representing atrioventricular discordance. Now, when we came to use our own approach, and as I say, we thought we were doing no more than modifying the segmental approach, we took the stance that when you look at the way the atrial chambers are joined to the ventricular chambers across the atrioventricular junctions, there were two major groups. In the first group, each atrium was joined to its own ventricle. And in that setting, the atriums could be joined to appropriate ventricles, for better or worse. At the time, we called that atrioventricular concordance because we thought that the concordance, as it was accepted at the time, was representing the way the blood flowed through the heart. So when the atrial chambers joined to inappropriate ventricles, we call that atrioventricular discordance. Again, believing that in Van Praagian nomenclature, this also represented the fact that the right atrium was pumping the blood into a morphologically left ventricle, whereas the left atrium was pumping the blood into a morphologically right ventricle. We had also recognized that in some instances, atrial chambers could have isomeric appendages. So we then wanted to introduce a third arrangement, because if the atrial chambers have isomeric appendages, then irrespective of how those atrial chambers are joined to their own ventricles, half of the heart would show concordance, and the other half would show discordance. So at the time, we established that as ambiguous atrioventricular connections. But our major step away from what was Van Praagian thinking at the time was to analyze the arrangement in which the atrial chambers across the atrioventricular junctions connected to only one ventricle. And we had noted that in that setting that could exist what we call the univentricular atrioventricular connection either because the atrial chambers were joined to the same ventricle or else because only one of the atrial chambers had a connection with the ventricular mass. So let me show you the parts that we produced at the time to substantiate this approach to what we call sequential segmental analysis. So this is a heart that we cut so as to replicate the four-chamber echocardiographic plane. And what you clearly see is that in this particular heart, the right-sided atrioventricular junction, the left-sided atrioventricular junction are joining together and they are entering the same big ventricle. And when we look at the apical part of this big ventricle, it has fine crisscrossing trabeculations. So what we see here is a very nice example of double inlet left ventricle. But in the hearts that I came across in the archive that I was establishing at the time at the Brompton Hospital, I came across this heart. Now again, in this heart, we see the right atrioventricular junction, we see the left atrioventricular junction. And just as in the heart I showed you a moment ago, the two junctions are in communication with the same ventricle. But this time, when we look at the apical trabeculations of this big ventricle, they are coarse, because this time the atrial chambers are emptying together into the morphologically right ventricle. So we have double inlet right ventricle. Now, during this period, 
we also came across this heart, which was entered into the archive at the Royal Brompton Hospital. I've opened it in clam-like fashion, and very nicely, I hope you see. Both atrioventricular valves are emptying into this ventricular chamber, but the ventricle is also giving rise to both outlet components. It has exceedingly coarse apical trabeculations. These, in fact, are much coarser than what we see in the normal right ventricle. And we looked all over the epicardial surface of this ventricular chamber, hoping to find a second small ventricle. But we could not find a second chamber. So we reached the conclusion that in this instance, we were dealing with double inlet to, double outlet from, a solitary and indeterminate ventricle. So we found three types of hearts in which there was double inlet ventricle, but then we also looked at hearts using the echocardiographic approach and simulating the four-chamber cut in the setting of atrioventricular valvar atresia. And this is one of the cuts I made at the time in the setting of classical tricuspid atresia. I'm going to come back shortly and discuss tricuspid atresia again. But what we found at that time, as has been substantiated since, that in the greater majority of patients and also hearts with classical tricuspid atresia, we have the situation in which the left-sided inlet, guarded by a mitral valve, is joining a big ventricle that, just as in double inlet left ventricle, as left ventricular apical trabeculations. But what we also see when we cut the heart in four chamber fashion is that the right atrium has no communication with the ventricular mass because the essence of this variant of atrioventricular valve atresia is absence of one of the atrioventricular connections. So we appreciate it now that in the setting of many examples of atrioventricular valvar atresia, you could have another form of univentricular atrioventricular connection. But as we looked through these hearts, and when we made correlations with the echocardiographic images that were appearing at the time, we also appreciated that the way in which the atrial chambers pump their blood across the atrioventricular junctions could be modified by the morphology of the valves guarding those junctions. And so as part of what we called sequential segmental analysis, we also introduced the notion of modifying the atrioventricular connection, what we call the mode of atrioventricular connection. And here are the options that we introduced, separate valves versus common valve, perforate versus imperforate valves, and straddling and overriding valves. So let me show you examples of these first two subsets, and let me try to explain our thinking at the time. So what I'm showing you here is a four-chamber section through a normal heart. You will immediately recognize to your left hand, you see the pectinate muscles extending around the right AV junction, and that tells us that we're dealing with a morphologically right atrium. To your right hand, you see the smooth wall of the morphologically left atrium. And also on the top corner, you see the venous channel, which confirms that this is a morphologically left atrioventricular junction. And what we see is that the atrial chambers, in this instance, are pumping their blood into their appropriate ventricles because there are separate right and left atrioventricular junctions. And this, of course, is the usual arrangement. But we also appreciate that in the setting of atrioventricular septal defect, and the essence of atrioventricular septal defect is the commonality of the atrioventricular junction, which in this particular heart is guarded by a common atrioventricular valve. Again, you see the pectinate muscles extending to the crooks to your left hand, 
telling us that that is the morphologically right atrium. We see the smooth vestibule to the right hand, telling us that that is the morphologically left atrium. And again, you see that the atrial chambers continue to pump their blood across the atrioventricular junctions because the presence of the common valve does not alter the fashion in which the chambers are joined together across the atrioventricular junctions. And we also came a heart, cross hearts looking like this. And this is what modifies the atrioventricular connections to produce atrioventricular valvular atresia. Because here again, you have separate atrioventricular junctions. The chambers are joined together in appropriate fashion across those junctions. But if you look very carefully, if you look to what you see to your left hand, again, the arrangement of the pectinate muscles tells you that you're dealing with a morphologically right atrium. It's joining across the atrioventricular junction to a hyperplastic morphologically right ventricle, but the atrioventricular connection that in this instance is present is blocked by an imperforate tricuspid valve. In other words, the imperforate nature of this right atrioventricular valve is modifying the way that the chambers themselves are connected across, in this instance, the right atrioventricular junction. And this is the fundamental difference between imperforate tricuspid valve and the arrangement I've already shown you, which is what we see in classical tricuspid atresia, where we have a univentricular atrioventricular connection because it is only the morphologically left atrium that is joined across the left atrioventricular junction to the morphologically left ventricle. On the right side, there is absence of the right atrioventricular connection. And so we established, again, making correlations with echocardiographic findings, that classical tricuspid atresia is indeed the consequence of absence of the right atrioventricular connection. So we still believe that we were entirely justified to distinguish between hearts having biventricular as opposed to univentricular atrioventricular connections according to the way in which the cavities of the atrial chambers pump the blood into the cavities of the ventricles across the atrioventricular junctions. And had we at the time appreciated that Dr. Van Praag was using concordance and discordance to describe segmental harmony and disharmony, if we had understood that very subtle feature, we should then have described what we were seeing not as atrioventricular concordance or discordance, using those words in inappropriate fashion, but instead saying that the hearts were exhibiting either concordant or discordant atrioventricular connections. Because when stated in that fashion, there is no question but that we are describing the arrangement that the chambers are joined together across those junctions. So the response of Dr. Van Praag to our notion of connections was rather disturbing because he then suggested along with his colleagues that in fact the segments did not connect to each other and this was because in his opinion there were additional connecting segments. And those connecting segments are the atrioventricular canal and the conus. And so on that basis, he and his colleagues suggested that what we called connections should really be called alignments. And by my understanding, that continues to be the case. So is it justified to dismiss the notion that the cavities of the various segments are joined together or connected across the atrioventricular junctions. Do indeed the atrial chambers connect to the underlying ventricles? And are, is there the presence of these connecting segments? 
And how, if we resolve these questions, can we then see the impact that these approaches have on the description of normal as opposed to abnormal ventricles? So let me take you through what is going on with the notion of these connecting segments. Because since my alleged retirement, as many of you know, and as we saw in previous classrooms, I've been looking very closely at the way the heart develops. And I've been able to do this using these beautiful data sets. You see one of them here, prepared by my friend and colleague, Tim Mohan, using the technique of episcopic microscopy. And the beauty of this technique is that, as you now do with computed tomography or magnetic resonance imaging, it is possible to rotate these data sets to cut them in any particular plane. So interrogate the same data set in different directions. So here I'm showing you a four-chamber cut through the developing heart at an early stage. You will recognize the right atrium, your left hand, you see the cavity of the left atrium, and you can see the beginning of septation. Because there, growing down from the atrial roof, is the primary atrial septum. But at this early stage, unequivocally, we do have an atrioventricular canal. But you can also see that at this early stage, the atrioventricular canal is pumping the blood only into the developing left ventricle. You can then see, however, that already we have the basis for formation of the right ventricle. And if we take the data set, and if we turn it and we cut it, so we replicate what now you can use echocardiographically as the subcostal oblique cut, there you see the large cavity of the right atrium, and there you see the developing apical component of what will become the right ventricle. And you then see that at this early stage, because the atrioventricular canal is connected exclusively to the developing left ventricle, there is no connection between the cavity of the right atrium, the cavity of the developing right ventricle. But you also see but at this early stage, the entirety of the outflow tract is supported by the developing right ventricle. And it is the proximal part of this developing outflow tract that Dr. Van Prague identifies as the conus. So again, at this early stage of development, there is an atrioventricular canal, there is a conus, and we can also see but at this early stage, the conus is undivided. It is a common conus. Within the conus, however, there are these columns of endothelial tissue that eventually will be columns that we call the cushions or the ridges, and they will divide this conus into the aortic and pulmonary components. But at this early stage, the conus is a common entity arising from the developing right ventricle. Shortly later, however, at the stage, which we call Carnegie stage 14, we can see that the atrioventricular canal has expanded. And now, because it's expanded, it has direct access to the developing right ventricle. But we also know that as the atrioventricular canal expands, and as it develops, the tissue plane develops to separate the atrial and ventricular segments of the heart such that the atrioventricular canal becomes sequestrated as the vestibules of the atrial chambers. And indeed, if we turn to another human embryo, this time at Carnegie stage 20, again I've cut it in oblique subcostal equivalent, there you now see the apical trabecular component of the right ventricle, and now it has its own inlet. And we know by the location of the plane of atrioventricular insulation that the atrioventricular canal has been sequestrated as the vestibule, the right side of the atrioventricular canal, as the vestibule of what is now the right atrium, 
we also see the developing ventricular arterial junction, and that tells us that the conus has been incorporated into the ventricular mass as the infundibulum of the right ventricle. The other half of the conus is incorporated into the left ventricle, but in so doing, it loses the myocardial makeup so that there is aortic to mitral fibrous continuity. So the connecting segments do exist in the developing heart, you can see where they are, but with ongoing development, key with formation of the junctions, and remember, it is the junctions we are concentrating on in sequential segment analysis. So with the formation of the junctions, the atrioventricular canal becomes the vestibules of the atrial chambers, whereas the conus is divided to become the ventricular outflow tracts. So how now do these changes that occur between the developing heart and the postnatal heart, how do they influence the description of the definitive ventricular mass? Well, as I've already emphasized to you, the essence of our sequential segmental analysis was to recognize the junctions. And now in the definitive heart, clearly we see the atrioventricular junction, that is the insulating plane between the atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium. We can also recognize the ventricular arterial junction, where the myocardium of the ventricular mass gives way to the fibrous arterial walls of the arterial valvar sinuses. And then when we look at the ventricular mass in this fashion, we can clearly see that it possesses an inlet component on the right side, an apical part that is coarsely trabeculated, and a tubular outlet, the conus or the infundibulum, extending to the ventricular arterial junction. And then when we look at the left ventricle, we see exactly the same thing. We can recognize the atrioventricular junction, and we can recognize the ventricular arterial junction. Again, we see the left ventricle has an inlet, guarded, of course, by the mitral valve, an apical part, which is finely trabeculated, and then an outlet, which is abbreviated when compared to the outlet of the right ventricle, because almost always in the left ventricle, the myocardium that is initially present as the outlet is transferred to the left ventricle becomes attenuated so that the feature of the roof of the left ventricle is fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic and mitral valves. But both ventricles, when analyzed in this fashion, have three parts. And so now, once we recognize the junctions, once we recognize what has happened to the atrioventricular canal? What has happened to the conus? We remove the need to postulate the existence of connecting segments. But more importantly, when we analyze the ventricular mass in that tripart type fashion, it clarifies what we're going on when we have abnormal ventricles. And that is because the inlets and the outlets in the congenitally malformed hearts are not necessarily shared in equal fashion between the apical parts. And again, we can go back to development and we can see how we can apply this notion of tripartite ventricular development to the congenitally malformed heart. This is, this is the picture I've already shown you. An oblique subcostal cut through the developing human heart at the early stage, where the right atrium pumps the blood into the left ventricle atrium, the left atrium to the left ventricle, because the atrioventricular canal is exclusively connected to the left ventricle. But already at this early stage, we see formation of the apical part of the right ventricle, but it lacks the direct connection to the cavity of the right atrium, although it supports the entirety of the developing outflow tract. So here, early in development, we have an incomplete right ventricle. It is waiting to acquire its own inlet. And then 
when we make comparisons with genetically malformed heart, that is what we see in classical tricuspid atresia. So here I'm showing you a heart with classical tricuspid atresia from the front. You will recognize the right atrial appendage. There is the right ventricle, beautifully delimited by coronary arteries. And clearly now you see the absence of the right atrioventricular connection. But this also shows the problem with using the words alignments as though they are the same thing as connections. Because unequivocally, in the setting of classical tricuspid atresia, the cavity of the right atrium is aligned with the cavity of the right ventricle. But although the two chambers are aligned, they are not connected to each other. So connections and alignments, unfortunately, are not the same thing. The difference, however, has a great influence on the morphology of the right ventricle. And this is the also the ongoing bone of contention between the way we describe the heart using sequential segmental analysis and the way that Dr. Van Praag still describes it using, as I understand it, the segment approach. So let's look at the morphology of the right ventricle in the setting of tricuspid atresia as opposed to double inlet left ventricle. So here I'm showing you the atrial chamber in the setting of tricuspid atresia. This is the opened right atrium. You are looking in to the floor of the opened right atrium and it is entirely muscular. But there in the floor of the right atrium is what is known as the dimple. Now, when I started in the field, it was presumed that the dimple represented the imperforate right atrioventricular valve. And it was presumed that that dimple connected with the right ventricle. But in fact, when we started sectioning the hearts, we showed that that was not the case. So this is a cut that has been made by another of my close friends and collaborators, Diane Spicer. And it's a quite exquisite cut, and it's concentrating on that right-sided area of alignment between the right atrium and the underlying right ventricle. And there you see the dimple. You also see fat that is filling the atrioventricular groove. And within the atrioventricular groove there, you see the right coronary artery. And there is the cavity of right ventricle. And what you clearly see now is that the dimple is not pointing into the right ventricle, which is incomplete because it lacks its inlet component. The dimple is pointing into the left ventricle. And here is another heart, this time one of mine that I prepared whilst I was working at Great Ormond Street. And this time I cut away the atrioventricular groove that interposed between the right atrium and the cavity of the right ventricle to emphasize the fact that truly tricuspid atresia represents in most instances absence of the right atrioventricular connection. And this shows you again very beautifully how the dimple in fact is pointing not into right ventricle but into the left ventricle. In fact, the dimple is the atrioventricular component of the membrane septum, although on instant, in instances you can have double inlet left ventricle with an imperforate right atrioventricular valve. And in essence, classical tricuspid atresia is trying to be double inlet left ventricle. And it is the absence of that right atrioventricular connection that means that when we look at the morphology of the right ventricle, we see it clearly has an apical component, and here it has a long outlet that is supporting the pulmonary trunk. So here we have tricuspid atresia with concordant ventriculo-arterial connections, but the atrioventricular connection is absence of the right atrioventricular connection. Now, the contentious point is how we should describe the small chamber that we find in the setting of double inlet left ventricle. And is the small chamber comparable to what you see here 
an incomplete right ventricle lacking its inlet component. So here, in fact, is one of those small chambers in the setting of double inlet left ventricle. This is an unusual form of double inlet left ventricle, but I hope the similarity with what I've just shown you in the setting of tricuspid atresia is striking. Because again here, the small chamber unequivocally has an apical component, has a long infundibulum, but this time, as in the heart I showed you, the tricuspid atresia, it is supporting the pulmonary trunk. The aorta is arising from the big ventricle, which is morphologically left ventricle, which also has double inlet. And this, of course, is what is known as the Holmes heart. And so when we compare examples of double inlet left ventricle with tricuspid atresia in the setting of the same ventriculo-arterial connection, the similarities between the small chamber is striking, just as it is now when we compare the arrangement as we see it with discordant ventriculo-arterial connections. So here, the typical type of double inlet left ventricle, where both atrioventricular junctions are joined to the dominant left ventricle, unequivocally, the small ventricle possesses an apical component, which is an apical component of right ventricular morphology. In most instances in the setting of double inlet left ventricle, however, the apical component is supporting the aorta because the ventricular arterial connections are discordant. So is the big chamber a single left ventricle, as Dr. Van Praag still describes it? Well, it is true that in double inlet left ventricle, that chamber is a single left ventricle. But if we analyze hearts in that fashion, the normal heart has a single left ventricle. It happens to coexist with a single right ventricle. So what we should be describing and what we should be emphasizing is the fact that in both Dublin left, vent left ventricle and classical tricuspid atresia, that single left ventricle is also the dominant left ventricle in both chambers. The small chamber is a single incomplete right ventricle and both are functionally univentricular hearts, but in this setting, the atrioventricular connection in both cases is anatomically univentricular. So if I summarize what I've tried to tell you today as I've tried to explain the reasons that these differences developed and how hopefully now we can circumvent those differences and move forward towards consensus, there is no question that the cavities of the segments do connect across the junctions to the ventricles beneath them. Also, as I hope I'll convinced you, in some instances, a connection can be absent. And what also I hope I've shown you is that the anatomy of those junctions, though the way that the atrial chambers are unified with the ventricles beneath them, what we call the connections, that anatomy can be modified by the arrangement of the valves which guard the junctions. The connections between the segments can further be modified by the way that the component parts are aligned within them. And that, I believe, those relations would justifiably be described in terms of alignments, but I do not think that alignments can be taken to represent the same thing as what we are talking about in terms of connections. But the bottom line, if we describe what's going on, if we use the words we choose in appropriate fashion, then I'm also firmly convinced that it is descriptions that make things easier to understand. So what I hope I've been able to do over the period we've been discussing things today is the evolution of our own understanding. I remain convinced that it is entirely justified to speak of the chambers being connected together across the junctions between them, but now I will never use those words concordance or discordance other than to describe Van Prague 
meant them to be used in the first instance to describe segmental harmony or disharmony, the way that the chambers are connected, those we will describe as concordant or discordant connections. As I say, it is the way we use the words, hopefully, that makes things understandable. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. It was a very nice session and very, very clear. I think uh, we, we can use this classification, I, I, at least if that's the classification that I'm particularly uh, used to use. And uh, this is very clear. So we know uh, the connections and we know uh, the flow. So it helps us to understand the physiology. That's the way I understand uh, this classification. Thank you for that. We have um, some live questions. Let's start uh, with uh, uh, Carlos Jose. Carlos, do you want to make your question live to Dr. Anderson? You can uh, just open your microphone. No? Okay. We have Dr. Uh, Normo Silverman uh, once again with us. Hi, Dr. Silverman, how are you? Good you morning, can make Grace. Good morning, Bob. Morning, Norm. I can't see you. Open your video. Uh, okay, let me just see if I can do that. It's always better when we see you, Norm. Uh, um, I, I, oh, okay, let me just um, see if I can get into this here. Uh, oh, well, we can maybe hear you. But I can't do it. Let me just ask you my question because I think. Uh, First of all, let me compliment you on on a brilliant session again. It's you've gone. He's gone now. <laughs> okay. You muted yourself. Don't mute yourself. Oh, ah, yeah. Good now age. we see you as well. <laughs> Unmute. Muted. Norm, you're muted. You have to unmute as well. I'm ah. un now unmuted. I'm sorry for taking up all the time to uh, just get myself on the screen. Uh, Bob, that was brilliant and clear, as clear as can be. And of course, I'm um, being a, a disciple of yours. I absolutely agree with uh, your um, uh, issues with the uh, other <coughs> nomenclature. The, um, the thing is, how does one... Uh, not uh, actually accept the facts from embryology. It's so clear. But my question is to the embryology today, because you, um, I think that those were mouse embryo uh, sections and uh, you have uh, labeled them as human. Is that correct? Are they human or are they mouse? That's not correct, Norman. I do have lots of mouse embryos but I also have a limited series of human embryos that have been prepared in exactly the same fashion. And what that shows us, which I think is important, is that the basic steps of development that we see in the mouse that I have, as you imply, I have used very frequently, they are replicating what we see in the human. So although there are subtle differences in the murine heart compared to the human heart, the mechanisms are one and the same. So what we see in development in the murine heart can be taken, I believe, as being representative of what we see in the human heart. But apropos your specific question, all of the sections I showed you today were from human data sets. So that okay, is that's showing very important. what is happening in the human heart. That's fantastic. Um, are those uh, sections are only available through Tim Mohan or are they available as the Carnegie uh, collection is available? The, the ones that I have with episcopic material are all available and Tim Mohan has his own, uh, his own uh, website, but I think he only has mouse embryos available on, the, uh, on his website. But there is another uh, resource that is called the Human Developmental Biology Resource, which is HDBR. And you can enter HDBR through the web. And in HDBR, there are now large series of sectioned human embryos. They're not, they are done with hematoxin so they're staying with, with uh, histology. 
but the findings in those data sets are directly comparable with what I've shown you in the episcopic data sets. As yet, the episcopic data sets are not available for individual manipulation. There is, however, another series that is being developed that you've heard me present in the earlier workshops done with Wild Lamas and uh, Jill Hexpos, and we're currently, we have a manuscript almost about to appear on that, and in that, when we eventually publish that, the uh, interactive PDFs will be made available and people such as yourself will then be able to manipulate those uh, interactive PDFs and you'll be able to see the same things going on that I've now shown you in the episcopic data sets with the difference being that in the interactive PDFs, Jill and Wout have segmented the different components of the heart. They've segmented the for example, the, the vestibular spine, or they've uh, segmented the atrioventricular cushions, the outflow, we're arguing as to what we should call the outflow motors. I think they are columns. Wout wants to call them ridges. I would rather call them cushions. You will be able to play with those yourself and to see what's happening. So there's a lot happening in the field of development. And the point you made, the developmental evidence now appearing is entirely co uh, substantiates what we've been trying to say about sequential segmental analysis and your own support you know full well i mean and from the outset you've known and as i described today it was the ability for to use cross-sectional echocardiography which you were one of the major proponents i think it was what 1978 was it not when you first used uh, cross-sectional echo to show how easy it was to show the connections between the segments. Correct. Very That's good. Great. great stuff. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. We hope you're going to be able to see all of these great. sooner, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, well, Dr. We hope so too. We're doing our best to get them uh, in a position that other people can manipulate them. So as I say, the, the, uh, the Maastricht data that Wout Lama's Jill Hickspoor are working on, we hope we have that in, we're still discussing the manuscript at the moment, but we hope to be submitting that for publication very shortly. The Human Developmental Biology Resource we're also working on, and that, that, that is already available on the net. As I say, you can enter that through HDBR, or there's another way that anybody can get into it, which is called Hudson, which is H-U-D-S-E-N, and if you go in, to Google, either through HDBR or Hudson, you will get into the material that's available already. And there are serial sections that you can look at and they are, they're quite good, but we're working on making them better. Amazing. If you could please send me this information by email, I can forward that to all the attendees. So you're going okay. to receive a post attendees, a post attendance uh, email, and I'm going to send you these links uh, so if you can uh, uh, see them. So we have some, uh, some people who, who want to make you questions. So let's start with um, um, Ella Taffy. Ella Taffy, do you want to make a live question to Dr. Anderson? Dr. Anderson, good evening. Good evening to Dr. you. Dr. Anderson, uh, thanks for this elegant uh, talk. Uh, my question, uh, does the European approach at the use to call, we like to, to call it, Anderson approach uh, changed the definite definition of single ventricle anatomy in comparison to the Van Braal approach? Well, that's what I tried to explain to you today because we do not think that the only single ventricle anatomically is the one that has a solitary and indeterminate ventricle. When you have double inlet left ventricle, Dr. Van Prague still calls that a single left ventricle. And as I tried to explain today, the normal heart has a single left ventricle. It coexists with a single right ventricle. And it's the same with double inlet left ventricle because the small chamber that Dr. Van Prague still calls an infundibular outlet chamber, in fact, is an incomplete right ventricle. And there's a paradox here because when you have double inlet left ventricle, with right-sided infundibular outlet chamber, Dr. Van Prague calls that a D loop. Well, it could only be D 
if there was a right ventricle present on the right side to make it D. So there's inconsistency in the way that the Van Pragians also approach this when they say that there is only a single left ventricle. And the early in our evolution, we realized there was a problem. We were describing things because we, you, you may well know, we had problems when we had straddling and overriding uh, atrioventricular valves. And at that stage, we said if 50% of an overriding valve was going into the left ventricle, we would call it double inlet left, left ventricle. If only 49% was going in and now 51% was going into the right ventricle, we would call it concordant atrioventricular connections. And it was immediately pointed out that that was a nonsense because the ventricles themselves had not changed. And so it was that approach in the setting of straddling valves that immediately became obvious to, to us. It was a notion to disqualify. It was ridiculous to try to disqualify chambers from ventricular status according to the amount of atrioventricular junction they received. And that, in fact, was the essence of what Dr. Van Prague himself said in the setting of double inlet right ventricle. And if it works in double inlet right ventricle, it works just as well in double inlet left ventricle. So that is the difference. The only single ventricle that we think exists is the solitary and indeterminate ventricle. And we think that Dr. Van Prague, frankly, is wrong when he tries to tell us that in the setting of double inlet left ventricle, the second chamber is not a ventricle, but is an infundibular outlet chamber. And all the time now, those of you who are using computed tomography, or even now with cross-sectional echo, you can see that that small chamber has an apical component. It's an incomplete right ventricle. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Carlos or uh, Abebek wants to make a question. If, uh, while they turn on their cameras and audios, I have one question that someone from the audience made and I really want to know about it, about crisscross. Ah. Now, Chris Cross is a fascinating entity. I mean, when we first, the, the problem with Chris Cross is that at first we thought that Chris Cross was uh, one of the uh, aberrations of segmental harmony. But in fact, we then realized that was not the case. And the, the, in most instances of Chris Cross, all you have is either twisting of the ventricular mass or tilting of the ventricular mass. And now we call the crisscross heart, thanks to the work that you and you did, now in Toronto at the time when he first started working on this, he was still in Korea. And she, June and I have worked a lot of this. And we know that uh, the initial hearts that we called crisscross hearts were twisted atrioventricular connections. And the key there is you do not change the topology of the segments by twisting them. So even though if you have discordant atrium, think of congenitally connected transposition, usually you expect the morphologically right ventricle to be left-sided when we have congenitally corrected transposition with usual atrial arrangement. If you twist that heart, you can move the right ventricle so that it becomes right-sided. But in doing that, you haven't changed the ventricular topology. It is still Mirror, uh, usual atrial arrangement with left-handed ventricular topology. So in Van Pragian terminology, there is still atrioventricular discordance. We do know, however, that exceedingly rarely you can find situations where in the setting of with the heart being twisted, you can have segmental disharmony. And I have one heart in particular where the morphologically right atrium connects to the morphologically right ventricle. So in Van Pragian terminology, that is segmental harmony. So that is atrioventricular. Sorry, so the, I, I take that back. The morphologically right atrium connects to the morphologically right ventricle, but in that heart, there is left-handed ventricular topology. It's exceedingly rare. So in Van Pragian, terminology, there is atrioventricular discordance because it's situs solitus and left-handed topology, but in our approach, there are concordant atrioventricular connections. So that is the one situation where you have to describe 
both the segmental arrangement and the way the, the, the chambers are joined together. And that is why connections are so important. Thank you for the answer. And I think Marianne wants to say something, wants to make a question. Marianne? You need to be unmute. Uh, just uh, to let you know, Dr. Anderson, we have people uh, from Brazil, Guatemala, Jamaica, Vietnam, um, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, it's been uh, Russia. First time I've seen someone from Russia. Welcome. And we have people from all over the world. This has been uh, Mexico. This has been uh, an amazing uh, meeting. So I uh, noticed that by seeing the number of participants that we have and also from the chats. And it's very nice from the chats that we see welcome from all over the place. So it's good that we are broadcasting. And uh, I think, Grace, we also, you have the recorded sessions on your website, do you not? And they're also being hosted on the Hart University so people can uh, get them if they've missed the direct presentation. I think that is correct, is it not? Yes, we have all the sessions uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel. Uh, these sessions, Mary and Dr. Silverman's, uh, we don't have yet. Uh, the master classes we have, and uh, everybody can see them anytime on YouTube. And this is and good. That's all for free. Sorry? All for free. They don't have to pay. No, all for free. And we are very. I noticed there was also a question about continuing medical education. Are you going to be making efforts to make the two, to have the material, uh, what is it, I suppose, uh, as a, uh, suitable for presentation for continuing medical education? And will it be become suitable for that purpose? Now we are discussing that, but we haven't decided yet how we are going to deal with that. About the, the certificate of attendance, anyone who needs a certificate, just a reply to the email that you got to your registration, and we can send you a certificate of attendance. But for CME, we are not there yet. We are discussing that. And presumably you'll send the certificates electronically, because it would cost, it cost you a small fortune in mail if you had to put them all in the mail. This is true. They're going to receive uh, uh, by email. You're becoming a very busy girl, Grace. <laughs> and on the top of that, I have to, to take care of my ICU patients. <laughs> <laughs> I was in service this week. It was tough to deal with everything. But it was good and my patients improved and I'm very happy for my week on service. Okay, um, I think we have one more question here. Um, uh, Janine uh, asked if is there a membranous uh, septum in the classic tricuspid atresia? There is no mem. That's that. There is no membranous septum between the ventricles. The, the looking into the the area of the membranous septum is becoming very interesting. We're looking at that increasing now, even in the normal heart. We're finding quite marked variations that we hadn't expected. So the, the, the membranous septum is derived from the tubercles of the atrioventricular cushions. And so in, in tricuspid atresia, it's my own belief that the atrial septum comes down uh, in oblique fashion and sort of walls off the right atrium from the atrioventricular canal. So I think there the rightward margin of the atrioventricular cushions can persist as an atrioventricular part of what would then be comparable to the membranous septum. But there's no interventricular component of the membranous septum. And always in classical tricuspid atresia, not if you have an imperforate tricuspid valve, but in classical tricuspid atresia, where the right ventricle is incomplete, always the, the, the ventricular septal defect, the channel between the ventricles, when viewed from the right ventricle, has exclusively muscular borders. So you can never have a perimembranous defect in the setting of classical tricuspid atresia. The defect is a muscular defect. It can be doubly committed and juxta arterial if you have fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the pulmonary aortic valves, but always there will be a myocardial bar inferiorly because it is the primary interventricular communication. Okay, I think Marian is back. Marian, are you able to speak now? 
I think she still has some uh, technical issues. We have a question from Yusuf saying that uh, in ECHO, when we evaluate univentricular, atroventricular connections, when L LV is in posterior and inferior position and RV is in superior and anterior position, is this rule always true? As far, I have never seen a heart. I mean, it's always dangerous for me to say never, but thus far, I think that is a very good rule. And uh, I take the stance that when the, if you find the small chamber and it's on the shoulders of the ventricular mass, then that small chamber will always be a right ventricle. On the other hand, if you find the small chamber and it's in, it's in the behind of the ventricular mass, if it's in the hip pockets of the ventricular mass, then that small chamber will be a morphologically left ventricle either can be right-sided or left-sided, and I have yet to see an exception to that rule. But as soon as someone says, I've yet to see an exception, you can bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow someone will come up and say, well, here's the exception that tests the rule. But I think that is a very good working approach to telling the, uh, the morphology of the dominant ventricle but I think nowadays with computed tomography, with resonance imaging, it's becoming much easier to see the apical trabecular makeup of these uh, of, of big uh, dominant versus uh, small ventricles. But as a general rule, echocardiographically, the rule just as put forward, I think, is a very is 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 the working one. With and that, I, as I say, I have yet to see an exception to that. Okay, thank you for that. And the last question on the sake of time. Uh, Samira is asking, uh, what is the difference between ventricular and fundibular fold and conus? The conus is the entirety of the outflow tract of, the, uh, of either ventricle. So you have two conuses in, in double outlet right ventricle, which we're going to be discussing next week. One of the bones of contention there was whether you always needed to have the so-called conus. And in that respect, it is the back part, the inner heart curve that is functioning as the conus. But in reality, the conus, and Paul Weinberg now talks about the conus as being the donut. And that's rather a nice analogy. So when you have bilateral conuses, you have bilateral donuts, and it's the back part of the donut that's adjacent to the atrioventricular canal that is the inner heart curvature, and that is the ventricular infundibular fold. But the conus itself is the entirety of the outflow tract. So that also has a parietal wall. And of course, it has, in many instances, a septum. So the conus septum is part of the overall conus. When we're thinking of double outlet right ventricle, and we'll talk about this next week in the setting of double outlet right ventricle and Merrill, I think is talking also about double outlet right ventricle in the building blocks. The conus itself has a septum, it has a back wall, which is the ventricular infundibular fold, and it has a front wall, and that is the parietal wall of either the right or the left ventricle, because the left ventricle also can, on occasion, have its own infundibulum. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Silverman, for joining us. Thank you all of you for being with us uh, today. We are very happy to have all of you. And uh, join us on Monday on Dr. Mary Mer Cohen uh, echocardiography uh, session. It's going to be uh, amazing. And next Friday, please join us with Dr. Anderson again in the same time. So we are going to talk about double outlet right ventricle. Dr. Anderson, thank you very much. It was amazing. This is really valuable to all of us all around the world. You're providing us something very unique and very valuable.